Welcome AP Hub team to our first flipped lecture for Unit 1. We're going to go over the basics of geography in this flipped lecture. Um, just as a reminder, as we're setting up our good habits for flipped lectures, at this moment you should have your geo log book, your composition book, out in front of you. Um, expectations, of course, is why we're going through the lecture and having some key points that you're taking notes. Um, that may be used on a future quiz or back for our review purposes. Now, the type of notes that you take during a flipped lecture is up to you. A lot of us have different preferences in terms of how we successfully accomplish taking notes. One suggestion I would like to offer that's a tried and true method, which is the Cornell note format. This is something that myself, I got through college taking Cornell notes. So if you'd like to try it out, again, the trick for Cornell Notes, simple format, you're going to set it up with a left-hand column. Uh, that is going to be left for your questions and your uh, headings on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you will leave a bigger column for the main bulk of the notes. And as we go through the different slides for today, that's where you would write down notes and bullet points and comments based on what I have lectured. At the bottom or at the close of any lecture, it's always a good idea to go back through the notes and write yourself a summary. Um, are you able to summarize or kind of pull out the main golden lines and key points that you need to take away from the lecture? Um, so again, just a suggestion, just to get us started, good habits, a, a method that may work for you for future note taking. All right, so let's go ahead and get down to the basics. Let's go ahead and start off with a simple definition of geography. In your textbook and key issue one, it kind of goes into some back history in terms of uh, the roots of geography. For our purposes, I want you to keep in mind that the word geography comes from the Greek word geo, which means earth. Uh, graphy means to write. So basically we're saying that we're studying um, what's occurring, whether it's landforms or human interaction on the earth's surface. Now there are two different types of geography, and remember for this class, this is AP Human Geography, our essential questions that we're always going to come back to is a study of where things are and why are they there. So for example, religion, language, business, cities. Um, we also in our class uh, on Friday, we looked at a Google Earth map of night and we looked at different lights that were popping across the Earth's surface. So why are those lights or those heavy concentrations, um, for example, in Western Europe? So these are questions as geographers we can begin to analyze. Now again, also, important to our class, but not our central focus, is physical geography. And that's more focused on the study of where and why natural forces occur. So of course we're going to look at climates, we're going to look at landforms, we're going to look at vegetation. Um, so this is also kind of woven into our discussion of human geography. Now as we're beginning to develop our mindset as geographers, we did emphasize that part of being a good geographer is looking at um, the world from a multitude of perspectives. Now you can see right here kind of the wheel of human geography. You can see part of this class in thinking like a geographer, we're really going to cover the spectrum. And this is why I say, you know, geography is a study of the world and um, all aspects. You can see on this wheel, for example, we have cultural geography human environmental relations, medicine, economic, political, psychology. Um, so human geography really is an up and coming field, like I mentioned in class, that really covers multitude, but trying to still keep that mindset of that spatial perspective. All right, so let's take a minute and let's think about what can we actually do with geography, big picture. I work on hurricanes, I work on earthquakes, I work on tornadoes and floods and a lot of other natural hazards. Geography is really important because we have to have maps that communicate very quickly what happened. I'm a senior physical scientist with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, FEMA, and uh, my name is Gene Longenecker. You've got to care about geography. In the intelligence world, to understand that something happened is very exciting, but it really isn't valuable unless you understand where it happened. I'm the president of the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation, and my name is Keith Masco. When I wanted to be, geography was very much a two-dimensional subject. Now with Google Earth, you can fly in to a city. I'm an economic analyst at the Environmental Defense Fund. My name is Olushay Pyanjit. Being an explorer 
it's basically being a, a geographer because you're trying to understand what our world looks like. I am a polar explorer, mountaineer, and expedition guide. My name is Eric Larson. For me, the crux, where there are so many things that can go wrong despite your best efforts. On an expedition, I really rely heavily on a map to better understand where I'm traveling and knowing if I need to get here, some of the obstacles that are, are in the way. And that means the shade by Andrea New Jersey is the 1996 National Geography League Champion. Studying geography makes you more appreciative of the world as a whole and of being a global citizen. And if you have from an early age been accustomed to thinking of yourself as a global citizen in addition to an American citizen, um, then that really gives you an advantage. By simply understanding the physical geography, you have to truly embrace and understand the human geography as well. And that provides things like culture, history, religion, language, ethnicity. Where a hazard occurs and where people happen to be is something that's very important. We need to know if it's a big earthquake and it's been shaking a lot, did it shake a bunch of people? An earthquake that happens out in the desert doesn't shake people. Once we're on the expedition, from the field, I can send an email that sends out my blog post, a picture, and my uh, GPS position, my latitude and longitude. And that goes right into a Google Earth layer that marks that on the map. So people can zoom into Google Earth, they can see my route on Everest all the way up to the summit. It allows us to be able to understand our planet and be connected to one another in a way which we've never been able to. All right, so when we dive into geography, as we mentioned before, our focus is human geography, but I also want to introduce some basic con concepts of physical geography. So let's go ahead and start off with the basics, continents and oceans. Uh, remember, continents are very large land masses that cover the Earth, and we usually focus on seven continents, North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, Antarctica, and Australia, and our four major oceans, which we'll be addressing, Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Arctic Ocean. All right, so a little map, just kind of visual, take a look at. So one of our first continents right here, we have Asia, which is one of our largest land mass. It has 30% the world land area and also contains 60% of the world's population, which is going to be extremely important when we get to our population unit. Our second largest continent we'll be focusing on is the continent of Africa. Africa has 20.4 world land area and it contains 14.72 of the world population. Now, Africa is also the continent that is surrounded by, to the north, can't see it on the map up here, we have the Mediterranean Sea. Africa is surrounded by the Red Sea. We have the Indian Ocean on the right side, and then we have the Atlantic Ocean on the left side. Now, Africa is widely regarded to be the continent where humans originated from, and it's also located on the equator. We'll talk about that in a moment, folks. The equator is basically the imaginary line that kind of uh, divides our globe in half to the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere. And because of that location, Africa also experiences a number of different climate changes when we start looking at climate zone maps. Now in addition to simply memorizing the continents for AP Human Geography, College Board also wants you to be very familiar with the different regions that we subdivide our continents. In the top portion you have a big picture view. For example, if we just looked at Africa, we have Africa as a whole and we had big picture view sub-Saharan Africa, which is down here. But really, folks, I want you to focus your attention to your studying at the Closer Look map. Uh, College Board utilizes this, especially when we start taking questions about FRQs. So, for example, if we go back to our example of Africa, we can subdivide Africa into Northern Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, Southern Africa. So definitely, folks, uh, there will be a map quiz coming up. You need to be familiar with these world regions um, to better better necessarily locate the different places we're going to be focusing on this semester. All right, with regards to Africa, I mentioned in an earlier slide, we also have the reference at the equator. Uh, be familiar, folks, this is some basics, fundamentals of geography. The equator, as you can see in this picture, is that red line that completely divides the Earth in half. Um, it divides it into our two hemisphere, which is the northern and southern hemisphere, and the equator is located at zero degrees latitude. Now, at the same token, we also have something known as the prime meridian. The prime meridian is the vertical line that will divide the globe into the west and the east. 
It's located on zero degrees longitude and it actually runs through the Royal Naval Observatory in Greenwich, England. It was created in 1884 so ships could know how far east or how west their home countries were. Now that also kind of brings us to our discussion of using latitude and longitude. We also have the discussion of time zones. Now time zones is featured into your textbook. I believe it's in key issue number one on page 18. Um, talks a little more in depth, but the Earth is a sphere made up 360 degrees, and every 15 degrees or so is going to make up a different time zone. All right, let's go ahead and watch one more little clip in terms of how to think of the world for the world time zones. Some questions I want you to think about and perhaps look for in the video clip. Um, how many time zones are there? What is the first step to actually calculate a time zone? And what is something called, they're going to mention, the international date line? Here we go. In the old days, each town would keep their own times, with a town clock being set to noon when the sun reached its highest point in the sky. However, by the late 19th century, rail had begun to move people across great distances. Schedules became very confusing as each stop was based on a different town's time. Thus, a need emerged to standardize time so rail could operate more efficiently. In 1884, delegates from 26 countries met in Washington, D.C. to agree on a prime meridian as a common zero point for longitude. The result was Greenwich, England, being selected as the international standard for zero degrees longitude and establish the 24 time zones. Today, most countries follow the hourly deviations, though they do not always align with longitudes for reasons such as keeping the entire country in one time zone, or altering times at certain times of the year, for example, daylight savings time. Time zones are based on the fact that the Earth moves 15 degrees longitude each hour. Since there are 24 hours in a day, there are 24 standard time zones. Time zones are counted from the prime meridian, which is 0 degrees longitude. Each time zone is counted at 15 degree intervals and extends 7.5 degrees either side of the central meridian. For example, Sydney, Australia, lies in the 150 degrees east central meridian, and the time zone includes all locations between 142 and a half degrees east and 157 and a half degrees east. Now I will show you how to calculate time zones. First, determine whether the time zone is in the eastern or western hemisphere. If the time zone is east of the prime meridian, such as Australia, it will be at an earlier time than Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT. If it is west of the prime meridian, such as Canada, it will be a later time. Second, count how many time zones away from Greenwich the location is. For example, Greenland is one time zone to the west of Greenwich, so I will subtract one hour from GMT to determine the time there. Oslo, in Norway, is one time zone to the east of Greenwich. So I will add just one hour to the current Greenwich Mean Time. When counting the number of time zones away a location is, count the time zone your location is in, but do not count the time zone that Greenwich is in. For example, I will count for Buenos Aires, Argentina. 1 2 3 4 So, if the time is 4.34 GMT, I will subtract 4 hours to find out the time for Buenos Aires. The time will be 0.34. The international date line is an imaginary line lying 180 degrees in the line of longitude on the opposite side of the Earth to the prime meridian. This line separates one calendar day from another. The international date line deviates in places to avoid crossing any land.